Hello, this is Doreen Young with the Audio Percolator. I'm here again with Dr. Frank Martin, and it's good to see you. How are you? Oh, exhausted. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm terrific, considering we're in the midst of a pandemic, but uh, well, it's it's subsiding, so I'm, I'm good, actually. I'm, oh. I'm very hopeful. Well, you look good, Frank, and it's good. It's always good to see you. Today, we're having a very brief kind of uh, shortened conversation, an introductory conversation um, on our Every Month Is a series, uh, in this case, Women's History Month, um, Anna Julia Cooper, a name that many are not familiar with. Maybe we can just start by you telling us who she is. Well, Anna Julia Cooper is a very important um, African-American feminist and uh, in the past she was a suffragette and an advocate for women's rights and for human rights. So she's really more of a humanist philosopher. She was an administrator. She worked for many years at the um, M Street High School in Washington. And then she became the president of Frelinghuysen University uh, where uh, she literally saved the school from financial ruin and put her house up as uh, equity for the school uh, when they lost their, when the school couldn't afford to uh, sustain its own the uh, the structure that they were using to to give uh, uh, degrees from, and Freeling Housing was important because it was a school that was specifically created for African Americans uh, that would operate during hours that would not interfere with their work. So it was a school for general improvement of the uh, African American the colored community at that time. Uh, she was one of the early women in America to. African American women in America to receive a, uh, a college degree. And she attended Oberlin College in Ohio, which was noted, of course, for um, its equal treatment of African American men and women, along with the Caucasian students that attended that school. And what was interesting, especially unusual, is that in her class, you also had Mary Church Terrell, you had uh, Ida. Gibbs, who was later Ida Gibbs Hunt, both of whom were very important in the Niagara movement, along with Anna Julia Cooper, the Niagara movement being the movement that led to the uh, development of the NAACP. And her ideas, Anna Julia Cooper's ideas, are often used or even cited by individuals uh, who were very prominent male uh, participants in early African American intellectual engagement, like uh, W.B. Du Bois, who quoted some of her ideas in, in her um, excerpts from her essays, but he didn't always acknowledge the sources where uh, his information was coming from mm, in this instance. So that that thing that happens with men appropriating women's ideas was perhaps a little bit of a problem. Mm -hmm. Although she was actually an advocate in the, because you are probably familiar, your, your listeners are probably familiar too with that controversy between W.B. Du Bois and uh, Booker T. Washington. Mm -hmm where Booker T. Washington had a certain idea because of Tuskegee and because of his uh, education at Hampton of how African-Americans needed to be educated. And Booker T. Washington, who was very much an accommodationist thought, oh, well, it's best to create some financial autonomy, teach trades, teach uh, uh, the African-American populace how to be the very best maids and butlers and uh, Pullman car porters that they can be. And through this accommodationist idea, they will gain respect of this larger uh, Caucasian populace hmm. and slowly be accepted into society, which of course doesn't really work because built into the racist and racialist idea is a kind of denigration of the person who's being perceived as the other. And Anna Julia Cooper opposed that idea wholeheartedly and sided more with W. Du Bois, which said that if you were a person who's brilliant, your brilliance has to be acknowledged. You have to work on the level of what you're able to achieve and not accommodate yourself to someone else's bizarre bias against you. Yes. So she was extraordinary. She was, she was way ahead of her time, not only as a feminist, but as an intersectional uh, thinker. Mm -hmm. And I like that aspect because I think a lot of the, 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 the ideas of those very seminal times were... Um, defining ideas but they weren't they shouldn't have been taken as black and white as they were they were they were good elements there were elements to be considered from all those arguments and from all those viewpoints to create um a new 
uh, vision or a new um, idea, basically. So you had talked, we had talked earlier about how she had some, uh, there was some ar other arguments that she, you said that she skewered. <laughs> skewered, I believe, was the, was the word you used. Can you uh, expand on that? Well, I mean, as I said, she was an intersectional, uh, she, before intersectionality became a sort of byword in contemporary uh, social theory, she was doing intersectional analysis. She looked at how our experiences are embodied by our gender, by what is perceived as our race, the projection of uh, the idea of race onto a, an individual. But she was not imprisoned by these projections by other people. She had like, an understanding and awareness of her own abilities. And she was guided by what she herself was capable of doing, not by what society wanted to project onto her, which is why at 56 years old, she decided she would go for her doctorate and it would be written in French. Um, uh, because uh, I think she had some difficulty with the residency because she'd done a great deal of the coursework at Columbia University, which is in New York City and some of it by correspondence. But she couldn't do the re residency requirement because she was still in Washington teaching and being an administrator at the M Street High School. So um, she was able to apply to the Université de la Sorbonne in Paris, and she did her doctoral uh, dissertation in French, and she went to Paris to defend it, and it was on um, the attitudes of the French uh, during the um, period after the revolution regarding slavery. I think it was, I'm trying to remember the title, uh, Les, Gardes de, Les Gardes de la France sur les Sauvages, um, D'après la Révolution, something like that. I, I can't remember the title exactly, but it's an extraordinary work because it analyzes the um, attitudes toward freedom of the Haitians and the, the Jacobin populations in the Caribbean um, and how that affects what's happening, what's, what was happening in France. And it's a kind of analysis that uh, up to that point had not really been appreciated. The only other person who might approach what she was doing is the Anglophone scholar um, Lewis. Uh, he was also a Caribbean writer. Uh, um, was it C.S. Lewis? I can't remember his initials right now. James, no, C.S. L. James was the other person who. Mm -hmm. um, we had, we had talked a little bit about her global, her view on global uh, relations, uh, especially when it came to people of color. We were talking about that this morning. I, I would love for you to speak a little bit about that because there was an opposing view about, um, I guess you had mentioned Frederick Douglass and some other scholars of that time. I, I would love for you to, to, to give our audience a sense of what well, was happening there. Also, what we were talking about briefly was, um, the, again, often in the uh, intra-group discussions in African-American communities, there would be a, a group that you might consider race people, race men, and one of these was Martin Delaney, who uh, was a big advocate for uh, African expatriation and for separatism. He was a separatist, but he was also an Afrocentrist purist. And he uh, criticized uh, Africans who had been mitigated in the Africanity by having the influx of Anglo-Saxon blood. That was the kind of thing he would say. And Anna Julia Cooper uh, attacked this divisive uh, idea with regard to examining the intragroup uh, po politics of African-American communities, saying that first of all, as a woman, um, and as a woman whose mother probably had been uh, imposed upon by her in slavery, because Anna Julia Cooper was actually born into slavery. Mm. And she uh, was born in Raleigh, North Carolina. And when she, uh, she never actually was given the name of her father because he was probably someone in the household where her mother worked. Mm -hmm. And so she was saying that um, she had no control over the uh, ancestry that she had. She had no control over who her parents might be. And indeed, that was often the case where African-American women were imposed upon <clears throat> violently by um, their enslavers or people who had power over them. And so that should not even be a consideration for how the African-American is perceived within his or her own community, that that was uh, obviously a very stilted and narrow view. And in this, she was, she was in agreement with someone like Frederick Douglass. And in fact, she, uh, in a 
an extraordinary essay um, called Woman versus Indian, because Anna Shaw, who was a feminist at the time, had predicated uh, white women's liberation on the um, subtraction of rights for Native Americans and African Americans. And she, uh, Anna Julie Cooper made these brilliant arguments for how that was so deeply flawed that you could not advance the women's movement without advancing the humanist movement that as uh, human beings, we had to all advance together and that the status of our nation and our humanity resolved and resigned within the status of the advance of African American women along with everyone else, along with the entire group. Mm. So she was entirely a pro-humanist, like I said, way ahead of her time and how she thought about these problems that only now we're coming to terms with in uh, the larger context of our totality of humanity as opposed to these um, subgroups that we belong to, these uh, side ethnicities. That was not terribly important. She was very proud of being an African-American. She was very proud of having African ancestry, but her humanity, her humanist uh, views defined who she was and what she expected in terms of her engagement with society. Mm -hmm. And that was what was just, like I said, transcendently brilliant. Yes, this is um, some, this is an extraordinary woman um, that we're talking about, Anna Julia Cooper. Um, we talked about also the fact that her and her, some of her colleagues were able to travel, uh, were multilingual uh, at this, you know, early point in, 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 I guess, in women's history. But can you tell us a little bit about that too? Well, I, I was saying that she went to school at Oberlin with um, Ida Gibbs, later Ida Gibbs Hunt, who also was very um, instrumental in the Niagara movement. And in the organization of those pan-African conferences that often you know that W.B. Du Bois participated in, the one in Paris in particular. And Ida Gibbs Hunt acted as W.B. Du Bois uh, translator for French during those crucial negotiations for opening that, that conference in Paris. And of course, as I mentioned before, um, Anna Julia Cooper not only uh, wrote her dissertation in French, which if anyone studied French grammar, <laughs> that alone is no mean feat to write at the doctoral level in French is itself extraordinary. Mm -hmm. But she taught Latin, she taught Greek, um, in addition to the courses in mathematics. So this, like I said, was a woman who was just brilliant in almost everything she engaged with. She was an extraordinary individual. And what was often so disturbing is how her views, along with other people that she knew, such as Ida Wells Barnett, um, uh, Charlotte Fortin Grimka, uh, women who were not just movers and shakers, they were really tearing things up. I mean, they were, they were <laughs> transforming society. Charlotte Fortin Grimka is the um, woman who was the, uh, I think she's the granddaughter of a ship's captain who had created a, an African-American ship's captain who had created a fortune who lived in Philadelphia. And she came south in the 1860s, I think in 1862, to help with the Port Royal project in South Carolina, which is one of the reasons why I was captivated with her. Mm -hmm. And she was a very good friend of Anna Julia, Anna Julia Cooper in Washington. Mm -hmm. And Charlotte Fortin Grimka used to write articles for the Atlantic magazine about what she was experiencing as a teacher in the South with the enslaved populations that were so desirous of learning to read, so engaged with um, wanting to move beyond the, the horrifying conditions of enslavement. And partly her articles helped uh, generate interest in funding the union side of the war. So these were women, and so you, you know about Sojourner Truth and you know about um, Harriet Tubman uh, as people who participated in the feminist movement in the war. These are African-American women who were engaged in these discussions as intellectuals. They were highly educated. They were extraordinary in every way. Yeah, there's a lot to be said about this. So we probably are gonna to have to revisit this subject a bit more, but I love this introduction. Maybe we can conclude a little uh, this, this, this conversation um, with your views on overall on how um, her work and Julia Cooper's work has, uh, has helped the people in general, you know, African-American women, but the, the world in general, and also um, how her views on cultural identity have affected your work or how they influence you. 
Well, she's a very direct influence on me because her um, idea of, well, like I said, before intersectional uh, approaches to the interpretation of social experience were actually a part of the intellectual discourse, that is exactly what she was doing. She is an important precursor to postmodernism. And um, I think postmodernism is often misunderstood because people think of it in terms of Jacques Derrida and deconstruction and this uh, disassembling of society. But what it is, is it's looking at all the component parts of our experience. Uh, it would include the impact of our lived uh, experiences as a particular gender, even our height, uh, our color, our education. She looked in her writings at all these things and she noted her own responsibility as an intellectual in the sustaining of sometimes oppressive systems because it would prevent people who had less education from uh, being seen for the uh, importance and accuracy of their own experience. So she was just so incredibly comprehensive as a thinker. And that's the thing that I took away from her, re from reading her, her writings. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that, that also was important was she understood that the group, the human collective has to move forward together. It's not a matter of my group put before your group. And to understand that so clearly at such an early stage uh, was extraordinary because many of the men at the time were advocating for well, for black male leadership and you know the thing that happens with testosterone it gets in the room and everybody wants to be the, <laughs> the head you know they want to be the, the big mm -hmm. person on the block i'm not mm -hmm. <laughs> right but she saw through that mm -hmm. and, and this is mm -hmm. a, a young woman born into slavery um educated at first at St. Augustine's College in Raleigh, North Carolina, then later on at, um, at uh, Oberlin. And then from there to her study in Paris, traveling abroad. And like I said, many of her cohorts also were uh, internationals. They had an international view of African diasporic issues and problems in the 1880s and 90s and into the very early part of the 20th century, uh, something that only now we're having major conversations about the diaspora. Mm -hmm. And so she anticipated all of this. It's amazing. And well, she lived to be 105. Oh my goodness. <laughs> she was born in 1858 and she died in 1964. Yeah, well she had, she, oh, wow. She had uh, a lot of intellectual energy driving her forward. I could tell you that, Absolutely. but this is wonderful. This was a great, um, conversation. The dogs are barking, as you can hear in the background, which is great for my recording, but um, they're all girls. They're too. commenting. Yeah, yeah they, they're all female they dogs. So, you know, <laughs> know the importance exactly. of Anna Julia Cooper. But I would like to revisit this again soon, and I'm hoping we get that chance. And I appreciate your time today in uh, oh, meeting in meeting with me to have this conversation. It means a lot. And um, let's let's do a part two. Please. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you, Frank. All right. All right. Thank Bye. you. So long.